NIH library, we, we have a wide range of members of this, of this working group. And the issue here was to see what we could do as an agency to uh, mount collaboration so that funding in the Down syndrome research area could be much more mobilized and enhanced, as well as to look at where there might be research opportunities because of the issues associated with comorbidities. The other institutes uh, volunteered to work with us, and the first action that we completed was actually to release a Down syndrome research plan. And I know many of you have heard me talk about this research plan so, so many times. The plan was prepared with the institute's help and in various institutes' help. And in 2007, December, we launched the report to the public. Now, I must admit that this was not just a report that came from a bunch of scientists sort of sitting in a conference room. This report was also monitored as well as provided in input. We got input from the community at large. We put the draft out on the website and asked family members and self-advocates to respond, which they did. We got hundreds, literally thousands of comments on the report. We took each of them very seriously. Uh, we responded to them personally, and we were able to include many of the comments uh, in the report. So we feel that this Down syndrome strategic plan really, really is a reflection of all of our various stakeholders and communities. So we're very pleased with that. And I believe that as a result of that collective uh, effort, that we now have a report that everybody supports, but most importantly, one that's given NIH a lot of legroom. And what I mean by that is since the report has been launched, we have seen an increase in our research uh, requests. Uh, we've seen an increase in applications. But most importantly, the report allowed us to put out some program announcements that we believe energized the research community in such a way that they became much more interested in participating in the research. Uh, one of the areas that uh, really was uh, highlighted as being critical to the field was to look at Down syndrome across the lifespan and to be very, very cognitive of uh, those living with Down syndrome now as a also uh, important to look at youngsters, young people with Down syndrome, and look at the issues associated with, with adolescents. And we are continuing to, to mobilize the research uh, community around cognitive functions uh, throughout the lifespan. Now, as a result of the working group's effort, uh, one of the things that came out of the strategic plan also was uh, the need for research infrastructure. And that's what I want to just take my last few moments to talk to you about. Uh, one of the things that the community, research community, as well as the families uh, and self-advocates asked us to do was to think about developing a registry. Uh, they wanted a registry, they wanted a data bank, and they wanted a biobank. Uh, they felt that these three entities were critical to future research in this field. And I think the most interesting thing about all of this is that we all recognize that there are several registries around the country. Many of them are hosted by uh, academic institutions, and many of them are actually hosted by Down syndrome uh, private organizations. But really what we felt we needed was a national registry in which we could bring all of the um, registry components, and typically the contact information that's associated with these registries uh, in one place, one site, so that everybody could feel that they hosted it. So we worked with our colleagues in the field and co-sponsored with the Global Down Syndrome Foundation a workshop in December, this past December, and this workshop focused on national registry, biobanks, banks, and uh, databases. And out of that uh, activity also came a, a strong uh, recommendation, I think, from the scientific community that we needed a venue for all of us who care so much about dance and to communicate through. And we decided that we would create this consortium that will allow the various stakeholders in Down syndrome to share uh, recent research information as well as to <coughs> look at where there might be gaps and where there might be needs. So from the DC, uh, from the December meeting here in the Washington DC area, we were able to talk about the registry, talk about putting together a venue for us all to discuss research and the future directions. And the NICHD, because the lead was given to us and we accepted it willingly, uh, decided that it was time for us to really construct the consortium and establish it. So we have now uh, established a consortium. There's a press release that talked about the inaugural meeting of the consortium that was held on September 29th, not quite uh, a month ago. And one of the very first 
uh, activities or action items that the consortium decided that it wanted to do was to put together a subcommittee to work on creating a national registry for Down syndrome. I can't tell you how important that registry will be uh, as we think about who is out there living with Down syndrome, not just the individual him or herself, but their family members, but also as you hear from our scientists today and you hear about some of the research that we've supported, that is critical if we're going to do any clinical trials and we're going to be able to look at new therapies, new treatments, we need to know who are the folks out there that need it. And this contact registry will be so helpful in that regard. So I want to thank all of you for being here, for recognizing how important this is, and I look forward to working with you as we move forward to really uh, share our passion with trying to do more to help the Down syndrome community. Dr. McCabe is the Anna and John J. C. Endowed Chair in Down Syndrome Research and Clinical Care. He's also the Executive Director of the Linda Cernick Institute for Down Syndrome and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Summer. Uh, and I also wish to thank uh, Caucus Co-Chair McMorris Rogers. Um, for your comments and the chairman of the Congressional Dancing Dance Syndrome Caucus for the opportunity to speak to you about the Linda Cernic Institute for Down Syndrome uh, and one area of our research, which is proteomics or the characterization of proteins as biomarkers that I'll talk more about in a few minutes. The Cernic Institute is a public-private partnership that was established in 2008 and involves the Anna and John J. C. Foundation, the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, the University of Colorado School of Medicine, the University of Colorado Boulder, and Children's Hospital Colorado. Our mission is to eradicate the medical and cognitive ill effects of Down syndrome and to significantly improve the lives of all people with Down syndrome. And that's really what attracted Dr. Linda McCabe, the real Dr. McCabe, uh, and me to the Institute, is that this is a chance to see a condition that has been considered intractable or hopeless throughout the course of our careers uh, and see that it can actually become treatable. And we want to be a part of that. And you'll hear from others today uh, that we aren't alone uh, in this mission. One of our research goals is to understand the genetic predisposition of some individuals with Down syndrome who, who have associated conditions known as comorbidities um, that Dr. Maddox uh, just mentioned. These include congenital heart disease, leukemia, seizures, autism, early onset Alzheimer's disease, increased risk of infection, uh, the, the leading cause of death for children and adults with Down syndrome is pneumonia, and we don't understand why that susceptibility is there. Autoimmune disorders like type 1 diabetes, celiac disease are increased, and then cognitive ability uh, and disability because the range is so broad that we really need to try to understand that as well. Research in these areas, as has been mentioned, will help typical children and, adult, and adults with these conditions. Uh, we will be developing biomarkers and therapeutics uh, for these conditions for people without Down syndrome. So the research will have an effect well beyond the Down syndrome community. Integral <coughs> to the research plan for the Sornic Institute is information systems and quantitative functions group that will permit the processing of extremely large input data sets to low output understandable information. And this output will include diagnostic biomarkers and potential therapeutics that we will move rapidly to clinical trials. Let's look at one group of projects that will involve identification of protein biomarkers. This uses a technology that interrogates the proteins and circulating plasma uh, the plasma of the blood, uh, which is referred to as the plasma proteome, to identify biomarkers associated with a comorbidity, and I'll use seizures as an example. We would draw blood to obtain plasma from individuals with Down syndrome, with and without seizures, as the comorbidity we're uh, discussing. 
we would identify a protein signature. There could be one protein, three proteins, a dozen proteins uh, that would uh, be different in those with Down syndrome who had seizures and those with Down syndrome who did not. We would then determine in another study whether uh, this signature is present before the onset of seizures. Can it predict who will develop the seizures? And if the, if the protein signature is predictive of which individuals with Down syndrome will develop the seizures, then we will move it rapidly into the clinic where we will continue to monitor its diagnostic effectiveness and we will develop a clinical trial to determine if prospective treatment before the onset of seizures will prevent the development of, of seizures or will minimize the seizures that that uh, child with Down syndrome will have. And we'll determine if the proteins in the signature are targets for known FDA approved drugs and then move those drugs rapidly into clinical trials. So we're moving from recognizing biomarkers uh, to diagnostics to therapeutics. Late stage translational clinical trials research will help us to achieve our mission and it will require genomics, DNA sequencing, and proteomics protein characterization for predisposition to the comorbidities and response in a clinical trial. Because as we get therapeutics, we know that some people will respond to the therapeutics and others will not. And it will be better to know up front if this drug is right for this individual or if we need to move on to another drug. To progress rapidly, these studies will require a national Down syndrome registry research database in Biobank. And Dr. Maddox has already talked about the meeting uh, last December 2nd and 3rd and the co-sponsorship with NICHD and the Global Down Syndrome Foundation. And there are two uh, reports that have come out of that meeting. I think one is here today uh, and will be included in the packets, uh, a proceedings from the meeting. And then Lynn McCabe and I wrote a commentary to accompany uh, that proceedings article. A bill, H.R. 2696, Trisomy 21 Research Resource Act of 2011, was introduced uh, on July 29th by co-chair uh, McMorris Rogers. Uh, and it was referred to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce that day, so it moved forward quickly. Uh, and then to the Subcommittee on Health uh, on August 5th uh, of this year. That bill uh, would support a registry database and tissue bank, uh, and uh, it's important that we recognize that that is a critical ingredient, as we've already heard. Uh, so please, uh, those of you with the power to do so, please support uh, that uh, HR 2696. It's also important to recognize that the consortium is bringing together people, and we need a more open culture for research in the area of Down syndrome. Our goal was to move the information forward rapidly and make a, dif a difference as effectively uh, as we can. Uh, and we have a model for that in the Human Genome Project. So we need to really go back to that model and look for open communication uh, in the research sector. And I'm pleased to say I'm seeing a lot of that uh, in the Down syndrome research community. Uh, so it's really gratifying. In summary, Research in the Linda Sarnik Institute for Down Syndrome will show that Down Syndrome is a treatable disorder when it hasn't been considered treatable. Uh, and if you, yet if you look at the course and the outcomes for people with Down Syndrome in the course of my career, clearly without technological intervention, there have been huge changes just with changing educational culture. Uh, so what can we do if we really uh, throw the resources of the NIH uh, foundations to really address this problem. Our research will identify biomarkers to predict who is at risk for developing a comorbidity and to identify protein targets for therapeutics. And it will demonstrate the value of personalized medicine for individuals with Down syndrome. So thank you for your interest in Down syndrome and for your participation in the Congressional Down Syndrome Caucus and just for being here today. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Harpole is our next speaker. Uh, 
Michael Hartfold is the Chief Scientific Officer of the Down Syndrome Research and Treatment Foundation. Uh, Dr. Harpold has had more than 35 years of experience in biomedical research, both within academics and in the biotechnology industry. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. And I want to thank the uh, co-chairs of the uh, Down Syndrome Caucus uh, for the invitation to speak today and to provide an update on what we see as really exciting research. I think there has been I mean, a number of the speakers have referred to the fact that, that things have really changed over the last few years. And I hope what I'm able to do today is to give you uh, a little substance to, to um, that progress. So it's not as simple as many of the diseases and disorders that you might read about in the newspaper these days where they may be single gene uh, uh, disorders. I'm also going to talk about and focus on cognition uh, research and why cognition research. Well, first, uh, the neurological manifestations of Down syndrome are, are in fact one of the primary disabling uh, characteristics. And they're also significant. They have a global impact on the uh, lives and behavior of individuals with Down syndrome. And as you're going to hear in a few moments from Dr. Motley, um, the majority of the individuals with Down syndrome also show the neuropathology associated with Alzheimer's disease by their fourth decade. And many are susceptible to further cognitive decline uh, mm -hmm. with age. So I really do want to emphasize that research is required both for children and adults. It's, it's an important uh, 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 target. As recently as 2004, there were no defined biological mechanisms. I mean, as recently as 2004, none have direct correlation with the intellectual or cognitive disabilities uh, in individuals with Down syndrome. And as a consequence, there were no drug targets. I mean, we talk about translation, the ultimate goal is to develop new therapies. And as a consequence, there were no drug targets suitable for drug discovery R&D that could yield effective new therapies. Significant reasons for this uh, include limited research and available funding. I will emphasize the, the uh, available funding because the two things go hand in hand. Research ideas, they need to have uh, funding to be able to pursue, to pursue those. Without continuing strong fundamental research advances, there can be no translational research. So I want to emphasize that while translational research is often the sexy in the things for, for biomedical research. Without fundamental research, you won't be able to get to translational research and the development of, of new therapies. One of the things I want to emphasize today is really three questions and how these are being addressed. And this is really critical for uh, uh, translational research. It's critical to actually for the involvement of the pharmaceutical industry in the development of new therapies uh, for, for Down syndrome. So successful development and approval of effective new therapies, including essential enlistment of the biopharma industry and their expertise, which is absolutely critical in drug development, requires answers to at least three key um, uh, questions. First, are there evidence-based um, dysfunctional cognitive mechanisms together with associated specific validated targets? that can ameliorate that dysfunction? So that's the first question. Second question, are there specific assessment tools available that can measure meaningful improvements, that is efficacy, resulting from treatment with new potential drug? 
And third, are there potential clinical trial capable sites? That's one of the, the points that uh, was discussed earlier. And patient participants that can be sufficiently and efficiently recruited for successful drug development and FDA approval. Historically, and up until recently, answers to each of these questions was lack. So that's one of uh, the critical issues uh, to, to focus on. Well, the Down Syndrome Research and Treatment Foundation, which I'm uh, representing today, is a publicly supported nonprofit organization. It was founded in 2004. It was driven by parents who, when their children were born, asked the question, where's the research? There's a lot of modern research going on. Where is it being applied to, to Down syndrome? Part of that is just because of the paucity of research, but clearly um, there was a motive there to uh, uh, increase the research that was being done in Down syndrome, specifically with respect to cognition. And the DSR, DSRTF, what we have done is we have developed and implemented a novel, comprehensive, proactively focused strategy to address, fund, and accelerate fundamental and translational research to develop effective new therapies to improve cognition. That includes learning and memory and speech in children and adults with Down syndrome. Now, how does that differ from uh, what Dr. Maddox spoke about in terms of the NIH uh, strategic plan? Well, first of all, the NIH strategic plan is, more, is certainly more comprehensive. We look at this as, as uh, quite complementary and an enhancement. Essentially, we're able to focus on specific problems and issues and act very rapidly and also take on some very high risk type ideas. That is to really spur the activities here. Well, the recent results uh, being produced through this strategy and the supported cutting edge research, since we fund, uh, also fund uh, research, um, illustrate the dramatic rapid progress uh, in addressing the critical questions that I mentioned earlier and towards the effective uh, development of effective uh, new therapies uh, to create new opportunities for children and adults with Down syndrome. This research, this is just an example of essentially what we did. We looked at, when people think about developing new drugs, you start off with discovery research and you go all the way through to an FDA approved drug. That's the essential component in the US for developing uh, uh, new therapies. So we looked at that pipeline essentially comprehensively and asked what could we do to actually accelerate the development of, of new therapies. This new research has identified specific dysfunctional mechanisms involved in cognition, something that was lacking earlier. This includes learning and memory. In animal models of Down syndrome and as many as eight associated new drug targets. And that's out of approximately 10 uh, uh, that represent, represents the, the current total of targets that are available out there. So the programs and research that we've been funding have actually now defined specific mechanisms and uh, uh, specific drug uh, targets. The <clears throat> Uh, dysfunctional mechanisms that have been identified and drug targets uh, include neurodegeneration uh, uh, of specific neural uh, brain and uh, neural circuits in the brain that are associated with learning and memory. This is an Alzheimer's connection, uh, as, as Dr. Mobley is going to speak about in, in more detail. There are actually four targets that have been identified uh, in that category. Impairments in connections and communications in specific neural circuits. This is actually can be summarized as an inhibitory, excitatory imbalance, neurotransmission imbalance in the brains of uh, uh, Down, uh, individuals with Down syndrome. There are three targets that have been identified there and validated. Uh, and finally, impairment in neurogenesis, the formation of specific neural circuits. Neurogenesis is the creation of, of these neural circuits. And there's been uh, one target that's been identified uh, there. The first two categories have been done by research, have been um, identified in research that we've supported at Stanford and UCSD, uh, at Dr. Mobley, uh, Dr. Garner, and uh, Heller at uh, Stanford <coughs> University. And the last involving neurogenesis is with Dr. Roger Reeves, who you'll uh, hear uh, subsequently today. And that's really important. It's not just that that has an impact on learning and memory, but the work that Roger's done has actually shown that 
uh, this particular approach can also completely normalize the development of the cerebellum, something that an individual with Down syndrome and, and in and wild is actually kind of small. So that's the situation for mechanisms, dysfunctional mechanisms, and, and targets. Additional research uh, has led to the development of the Arizona Cognitive Test Battery, which is amazingly, uh, maybe it would be surprising to you, but this is the first Down syndrome specific cognitive assessment battery that's uh, uh, ever been uh, developed. And that can be used for the measurement of efficacy in new drug clinical trials. That's work we've supported with Drs. Lynn Nadell and Jamie Edgen at the University of, of Arizona. Further research in the Down syndrome cognition project, which uh, uh, Dr. Reeves uh, also uh, uh, heads, uh, and it's focused on other issues that I'm not going to talk about today, but it actually includes a consortium of research and clinical institutions. And this has been used to further validate the ACTB, the Arizona Cognitive uh, Test Battery, an individual with Down syndrome, and also in the absence of a registry, which has been mentioned several times today, is actually providing a platform for a clinical trials uh, uh, network uh, across uh, uh, the U.S. These are, well, uh, I'm just I'm having a technological loss here. Um, these key uh, new advances have been critical in engaging by, for engaging biopharmaceutical companies. I mean, again, amazing. This is something that's not been done previously. So we put a fair amount of emphasis on, uh, on uh, engaging pharmaceutical companies. And that's really important for the uh, discovery and development of, of new therapies. And this has resulted just recently, it was announced in September of 2011, the multinational pharmaceutical company, F. Hoffman uh has initiated a clinical trial for a new investigational drug to address the cognitive and behavioral impairments associated with Down syndrome. This is truly significant. Virtually every group I've spoken with in the Down syndrome community has always come up to me and said, there'll never be a major pharmaceutical company interested in developing therapeutic. Well, I think the example would just prove them wrong. This is as a result of, of the progress. Well, I'd like to close with, there's been unprecedented progress. I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's exciting. It's exciting, I think, for the community. I think it's, it's really uh, exciting for researchers and clinicians uh, interested in, in Down syndrome. It's really created a buzz. This is popular when you go out and speak uh, to researchers and, and, and the community. Um, I think this is a compelling case, the results that we've obtained so far, for increased funding. Increased funding from uh, both federal agencies and, and foundations in, in the research. To really increase this and keep this momentum going, it's going to take uh, required uh, additional funding. One of the uh, points that's been made here is the idea of uh, the need for uh, uh, thinking about new approaches. There are new approaches. In fact, the funding is not caught up with the great ideas that are out there. These are the things that I talk to, to researchers about and clinicians about virtually every day. So we don't have enough. Their ideas are there. We need to act. And finally, if I just mention one final thing, this is going to require not just additional funding, but it's also going to require that uh, we have uh, uh, worked and essentially build on the success that we've already uh, established and the value and success of the cooperation, collaborations, and partnerships among highly talented researchers and clinicians, their institutions, the Down syndrome community and organizations, federal agencies, including across the different institutes of the NIH, and biopharma companies. All of these need to come together to increase the momentum and develop uh, therapy. If I just leave you with one final thought, uh, I think this is an unprecedented opportunity. I think this is an opportunity to seize the moment. This is one of those rare seize the moment opportunities. So the time to act is now. Thank you. Escape. Yeah, escape. 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 Upper left. Escape. Thank you. There you go.
Okay. <laughs> Mr. Sessions. Dave wanted to say that I'm in the room and I appreciate it very, very much. And I'm delighted to be here. And Michael, I would have lots of questions about what you just said. As a parent of a 17-year-old young man who is at his apex of desire to embody, to make his life better. I want to know how we're developing as a member of Congress, as one of the original founders of the Down Syndrome Caucus. We're intensely interested not only in what you said, but how we can help. So I joined the great Vince Randazzo in saying thank you for allowing me to be here today, and I'm going to keep listening. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mobley, and Dr. Mobley is the chair of the Department of Neurosciences at the University of California, San Diego and the director of the Down Syndrome Center for Research and Treatment at UCSD. circuits composed of neurons function in the brain. Everything that you do, every thought, every action, everything you like, everything you don't like, every time a congressman puts a bill together, I know, get this, every time they do that, they're actually using their brain. And their brains are composed of circuits, and the circuits are composed of individual neurons that connect to each other at a place called the synapse, this little, this little place up here with the arrow. Let me uh, say, in terms of a gloss, dementia is a decline of memory and other cognitive functions sufficient to interfere with usual activities. Neurodegeneration is a disease in which there's the dying off of neurons in which these circuits fall apart. A neuron is a cell that processes information, and the synapse is the point of contact between two neurons. Every neurological disorder is ultimately a disorder of circuit failure. And I'm pointing out to the synapse here because that's typically where these changes occur first. In Alzheimer's disease, they occur in cognitive circuits. So what do people with, that are healthy elderly people say? They say, I have more trouble recalling names and words. I know no one in this audience has had that experience. You've never had this experience. <laughs> never, see? Nobody said that. Recalling where you put things. Knowing you told someone something. Forgetting a task after starting it. I've never had that problem. <laughs> I was talking about this. Oh, losing the thread of conversation. <laughs> well, so it turns out this is quite normal. Um, I guess I'm elderly. I mean, certainly I fit this description. And I'm hoping that for a long time I'll have normal aging, and that aging will take its toll on memory, but basically I'll be pretty functional. But I want to be honest with you. It's very, I have a very high probability, as you do, of ultimately having something called mild cognitive impairment, which has three potential outcomes. 
One is that memory improves, and I'm feeling better again. <coughs> the second is that memory is stable, and I'm not so happy, but I can live with that. And the third is dementia. And you should know that mild cognitive impairment when it comes to dementia on a regular basis for about 15% of the people per year who are classified as having mild cognitive impairment. What's dementia look like? This is an interesting uh, series of paintings, self-portraits by an artist called William Untermolen. He uh, first top left picture is uh, just prior to his diagnosis, and the one in the lower right is what his paintings ultimately looked like, the inexorable progression of an inability to know who he was, where he was, and even what he looked like. This is your brain on the left side. This is the healthy brain that we all hope we have. Notice the dramatic difference in brain size on the right side. This is advanced Alzheimer's disease. Well, that just happens to other people, doesn't it? And the answer is no. As age progresses, we are, typical people, more and more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease so that by the age of 85 or so, 40 or 50 percent of the population will merit this diagnosis, most of it Alzheimer's disease. So right now, there are about, oh, 4 million people in the U.S. with Alzheimer's disease. Most are age 65 years or older. Patients typically live about 7 to 10 years after diagnosis, and current expenditures for care are greater than $100 billion. What about this oncoming epidemic? This is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease by decades. Notice that as we approach 2050, we are having a population size over the age of 85. It's quite large, 50% of which will have Alzheimer's disease, with lesser percentages at younger ages. But I want to make this point as clear as I can. A recent study of healthy 90-year-olds showed that 8% per year converted to dementia. So here's the likelihood. If you live to 102 and you don't have dementia, you're a very unusual, very lucky person. I think we should accept the idea that dementia is almost inevitable if we don't do something significant and quickly. It's not just us, it's the world. So that by 2050, the worldwide number of people with Alzheimer's disease or that care for people with Alzheimer's disease will exceed the current population of the United States. And we're talking now about trillions of dollars. What do we have right now? Relatively ineffective treatments. It's certainly nothing that modifies the disease. Cholinesterase inhibitors work a little. Mimetine works a little. But the truth of the matter is not much works. There are trials of the vaccine going on now we can hope for. But there were no less than seven phase three trials of Alzheimer's disease failed last year. We're in trouble. And not only are we in trouble, we don't even sure we're in trouble yet and when we're in trouble because we're making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease well after the pathology affects the brain. If you look at that little term MCI in the middle, see if I can find that for you. Yeah, we're making this diagnosis in about the middle of this curve, but notice that brain pathology with the A-beta peptide and with tau pathology and with brain structural changes are occurring more than a decade before. So here's the deal. Down syndrome provides us with an unprecedented opportunity to understand and prevent Alzheimer's disease. And it's the case because we can make this diagnosis very early. I was once at a meeting and they said, let's think about what would be the ideal biomarker or predictor for Alzheimer's disease. Let's get something that will be very accurate in predicting the illness. Let's find something that's capable of making the prediction well before the onset of illness. That way we can make an early diagnosis, study the disease, and, and treat it. Let's, let's find a marker that's rapid and inexpensive, generally available. You can do it anywhere, even in Nebraska, my home state. And let's find something we can administer to a large population. In other words, let's find a large population that qualifies for caring for them for this disease. And the answers are Down syndrome in every case. We can predict the illness with great sensitivity. We can make the prediction well before the onset of, uh, of the illness, for example, at birth. The rapid and inexpensive test is to look at the face of an infant. And Down syndrome is by far the largest known genetic cause of Alzheimer's disease. All those other disorders that are due to gene mutations 
pale in comparison to the number of people with Down syndrome. So there are mutations in the gene for the young white precursor protein and for presinolin 1 and 2. All of these mutations result in changes in the structure of this protein called APP, or its processing. Same is true in Down syndrome. In this case, it's an increased copy of the gene for APP. So special interest in the A-beta peptide product of APP processing and its toxicity drives the field right now. And it's very important for us to build on that research. So here are the targets to prevent or reverse uh, Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome. Through changing the processing of APP, uh, there's a new class of compounds just discovered at UCSD, which actually cleave this little peptide to something even smaller that we think will be non-toxic, worked by Steve Wagner in my laboratory, now funded by NIH UO Wingrid. Through an antibody to reduce the levels of this A-beta peptide, with uh, work now together with AC Immune Company from Switzerland. Very early success and very excited about that becoming uh, a drug soon. Through the use of APP-specific antisense oligonucleotides, you don't need to understand the names. The idea is that Down syndrome is the perfect disorder in which to use drugs that just turn down gene dose by a third. And then in discussions that are underway through restoring levels of missing neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and acetylcholine. Studies of the evolution of Alzheimer's disease in this population provide us with the best means to diagnose and treat it before it ravages the brain 50 and 60 and 70 who are just waiting to get Alzheimer's disease. We need them to actively recruit a larger research community to build a basic and clinical funded knowledge that allows us to go forward to build better drugs. It's not okay for NIH to say, bring us your best shot and we'll consider it. The NIH and Congress need to say, we have to have your best shot. We're going to be very aggressive about this. We're reaching out to you. We're not responding to, you know, passively. We're reaching out to activate you guys to bring us your best ideas. And oh, by the way, be sure to take advantage of the enormous resource that's provided by the community of people with Down syndrome. We need this. We need a new game. And every one of us in this room will benefit. Thank you. directions. You all have heard about um, some of the things that are more common in Down syndrome. Uh, we're going to change directions and talk about something that um, in which uh, people with Down syndrome may actually have some protection. Um, so my friend uh, Dr. Roger Reeves is going to speak next. Um, he's a professor in the Department of Physiology and a core member of the uh, McCusick Nathan's Institute for Genetic Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Karen. I'm uh, really happy to be here today, and even more happy that there is a Down Center Congressional Caucus to address. And I really thank you guys for your leadership and all the members who have signed on to the uh, members of this caucus. As one of the fairly small tribe of Down syndrome researchers who's been wandering in the desert for 25 years, is, you can't imagine how important this really is to us. So we all thank you for that. Uh, and I can see this with my glasses. So my marching orders today are to uh, tell you about some things that Down syndrome gives back to the rest of us, besides the things that we all give as individuals to society, and certainly Down syndrome individuals give in abundance. But I do want to say that you've already heard the most important thing that will be said today, and that is clinical trials are starting now for drugs that will improve cognition in Down syndrome. This was a dream for many, many years, but it's actually a reality now. You can go to clinicaltrials.gov and look under Down syndrome and look at the uh, details of what's going forward. But I'm going to adhere to my marching orders and tell you about some things that go on in uh, Down syndrome that benefit the rest of us. And the first one is congenital heart disease. Uh, this is the most frequent birth defect in all people. Almost one out of 100 babies will be born with a structural defect in the heart. And we have very little way to predict this, and we don't really know the mechanisms behind that, so we have no way to go forward 
and try and prevent this. So as a geneticist, uh, I have a hypothesis, of course, and that is that in order to get a genetic contribution that uh, causes congenital heart disease, you need to inherit a number of genetic risk factors. So the, the different blocks in this uh, thing here, will this come up? Yeah, so each of these represents a variant of the gene that provides a little bit of additive risk to the likelihood that one will reach a threshold beyond which that heart can't develop normally. So in order to get this, you see in this cartoon here, uh, it takes a lot of uh, different variants in different genes in order to add up to that total that puts you over the mark. In Down syndrome, we have quite an increased frequency of congenital heart disease. Uh, instead of one out of 100 babies, it's one out of two. Okay. So Down syndrome is an enormous risk factor for congenital heart disease. But on the other hand, 50% of kids born with an extra chromosome 21 have a perfectly normal heart. So it does not cause it. It's a risk factor. And the hypothesis is that with this large risk factor, instead of needing a whole bunch of different variants to add together here, uh, you, you may only need one or two additional ones. Well, this um, makes a little pretty cartoon for you guys, but for a geneticist, what that means is that the signal-to-noise ratio of that genetic signal just went up. And in our case, we're looking at the most severe structural deficit uh, called ADSD or complete AB canal. That occurs in one of 10,000 people who don't have Down syndrome and one of five people who do. So that genetic signal just went up 2,000-fold. So by looking at people who have Down syndrome, we can find these very subtle and individually benign genetic contributions that uh, contribute to congenital heart disease uh, in everybody. And so I have to thank all the participants of the Down syndrome Heart Project, uh, either with a normal heart or with an ADSD who have gotten involved in this uh, project. Thanks to them, we're learning a lot about what the genetic basis is for congenital heart disease. Number two, uh, people with Down syndrome get less cancer than the rest of us do. Kids have a high frequency of a very particular kind of leukemia and health, but uh, after childhood, the incidence of cancer is much lower. This table is obviously very small here. Uh, what it represents in the columns are a bunch of different studies. In the rows are a bunch of different kinds of cancer. And wherever you see a green block, the incidence of that kind of cancer in Down syndrome is lower uh, than it is in a comparable euploid population. A yellow block means it's higher. And in the uh, most comprehensive study of this done by the CDC in 2002, uh, they looked at over 18,000 people who had trisomy 21, and they looked at a very well age and gender matched population who didn't have Down syndrome and looked at all of them who had cancer. And the incidence of cancer in people with Down syndrome was 7% of the expected rate, a 93% reduction. So that's a huge protective factor against the uh, occurrence of cancer in Down syndrome. So um, using several mouse models, I'm now going to condense two dissertations uh, directly <laughs> and about four other kids' work for six or seven years apiece in 15 seconds. But I am a professor, so I have to profess a little bit. And I'm going to tell you about an experiment we did using a mouse model of Down syndrome and a mouse model of colon cancer, familial colon cancer. So the first column on this table represents the number of tumors in this APC mouse, which I say is a mouse model of intestinal cancer. And those mice have about 100 tumors in their intestine by the time they're four months old. If we cross those mice with the trisomic mice, the mice that are trisomic but carry that very same mutation have half the number of tumors. That's the second little column here. I don't seem to be able to get this thing to respond to me very well. And in um, also a couple more dissertations from Ohio State University, my collaborator Michael Strauss, gave us a mouse that was missing one of the genes that's trisomic in these mice, just one. So it's still trisomic for all the same genes except this one, and when we lose that one, the tumor number goes way back up again. So that one gene is responsible, and we've now overexpressed just that gene alone and shown that by itself it's protective. 
And furthermore, if you look at the mice that only had one copy of that gene to begin with, the tumor number goes way, way up. So this is significant because that particular gene was isolated and studied as a pro-cancer gene, a gene that gets mutated and causes cancer. Nobody ever would have done this experiment. It makes no sense at all. Even I would have done this experiment. <laughs> and so um, because we knew that there was this protective effect in Down syndrome, we could go back and use basic research approaches to this. And we now know about a gene that, when it's overexpressed, will protect against uh, COVID. So we're working very hard to find drugs that will uh, elevate that gene and reduce the risk of cancer in all of us. The second thing, people with Down syndrome have given to us. Number three, there may be, there may be a much lower frequency of atherosclerosis, the um, pathological process that causes heart attacks and stroke. Heart attacks, as you know, are the leading killer. Boom, oh, there you go. That's the highest one. Um, but we don't actually know, and the reason we don't know is we don't have a good research database for Down syndrome. You've heard this come up several times today. So we have a lot of observations of uh, clinicians which are absolutely vital because this is where we get the clues of what to look at. But without collecting the numbers, without knowing exactly what was looked at, how many people were looked at, who came down with a stroke, who did not have a stroke, we can't really make any progress in this. So we need this research database, and we need to have those uh, phenotypes collected by people who are all capable of collecting exactly the same thing. So we need the centers of excellence that go along with that, and then a biobank to keep the genetic data. Finally, uh, Bill has done a far better job than I could of telling you about Alzheimer's disease and the importance of having a population where you know ahead of time that these are individuals who will develop Alzheimer's disease. That's the perfect population for looking for the markers to detect which of the people in us are uh, susceptible to this. Okay, so people with Down syndrome give back to society in the same ways we all do, uh, some much more than many of us do. We know people with Down syndrome who are artists or uh, authors or TV actors. I certainly don't aspire to those categories. Uh, but in addition, the condition of Down syndrome teaches us a lot about things that are very important to us. Uh, heart attacks, cancer, uh, congenital heart disease. As these potential therapies come on online, which we believe have the possibility of really expanding cognitive ability and really changing the opportunity of expanding them, uh, my expectation is that we will see more and more people with Down syndrome in more and more aspects of our daily life. And we need to have a, a broader understanding in society as a whole that these are individuals who make a contribution in very many ways. So I think we, well, I am completely jazzed about the possibility of the therapy. We also need to think about the problem of getting these people their rightful place in society and uh, this huge battery of contributions I think is one of those places. So I thank you very much for your time. speaker is uh, Dr. Sally Schott. Uh, Dr. Schott is a pediatric otolaryngologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. She's also a professor in the um, Department of Otolaryngology. Upper left to safe.
Um, I am a pediatric allergologist. I'm much more of a clinician compared to your other speakers today. Uh, and I want to speak to you about obstructive sleep apnea in children with Down syndrome. Uh, just a little bit about OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. It's total or partial obstruction uh, during sleep. And this can occur in various parts of the airway, all the way from the nose down to the trachea. And it's a problem because it affects the whole family. Um, if the child doesn't sleep, the family doesn't sleep. And, and there are families out there who have been going 15 years without, with no one sleeping throughout the night. Um, in terms of how it affects the child directly, it affects behavior. Um, you can have overtiredness, you can have hyperactivity. It, many studies have shown effects on cognition, poor school performance, decreased IQ scores, um, more serious medical complications include hypertension, heart failure, and even death. Now, who's at risk for sleep apnea? Well, we know that children with Down syndrome um, are at risk, and they fall into the category of children with craniofacial anomalies. But actually, recent studies are also showing a very high incidence of sleep apnea in children with obesity, with the incidence almost as high as we see in Down syndrome. Children with asthma are, are at a higher risk for sleep apnea. And then we get into the whole adult population where there's a very high incidence, particularly in men. Now, in terms of the incidence in Down syndrome, our studies have shown that by age four, 60% of the children already have abnormal sleep. By age nine, 80% have sleep apnea, and this increases to almost 100% over time. Now, why, is, why does this happen? Well, there's some anatomic reasons. We have mid-face hypoplasia in Down syndrome, and that leads to a smaller oral airway, a smaller nasal cavity. Because the mouth is smaller, the tongue is too big, and we have relative macroglossia. There's then the, the decreased muscle tone. Well, that affects the airway also, and the airway collapses during sleep. On top of that, we have this higher incidence of underlying cardiac problems, so the children with Down syndrome are more at risk for developing more of the serious complications associated with sleep apnea. This has really led to new guidelines in just this past year. The American Academy of Pediatrics now recommends that all children with Down syndrome undergo a polysomnogram or sleep study by age four. The American Academy of Otolaryngology stresses the need for a sleep study prior to removal of the tonsils and adenoids in children with sleep apnea, in children with Down syndrome, and also a post-operative study to show that it actually works. In terms of treatment, removal of the tonsils and adenoids, or TNA, is still a first-line treatment. And I will tell you, we used to think this was a cure. Do a TNA, that cures sleep apnea. But more and more studies have shown that this is not true. Um, in children with Down syndrome, it only fully resolves the sleep apnea in 30 to 40 percent. And then in 2010, a very large study of almost over 500 typical children showed similar very poor results. So this is something that is a problem for everyone. Now, what are the medical and surgical treatments available after TNA? The most common medical treatment is continuous positive pressure ventilation, or CPAP. And that's where you wear a mask at night and it blows air, pushes air past the obstruction. And I have to tell you, it works if you wear it. And compliance is very poor and particularly very difficult for any child, but particularly ch children who have any type of developmental delay. There are surgeries that we do. Um, the thing with surgery is that the obstruction frequently occurs at multiple sites and multiple surgeries may be needed. And in addition, despite you know, our best efforts as surgeons, we're only getting about 60% success rates. The first key is to figure out where that obstruction is occurring. And Cincinnati Children's Hospital has really been a pioneer in the modality of using Cine MRI studies to help to determine the site and sites of obstruction. And this is a study where you do a, hunt, you, a child is sleeping, and you do an MRI taking 128 pictures over two minutes. So you get a movie of the airway. Now this child has enlarged adenoids. The adenoids regroup. This child also has glossoptosis. That's the tongue falling back. This is the tongue. The black is airway, and you can see how that airway is totally being obliterated as that tongue falls backwards. <laughs> In this child, the child has enlarged lingual tonsils. We actually have other tonsils. We have tonsils at the base of our tongue. And they show up really well in an MRI because there's more water content. And this child has 
very large lingual tonsils, again, obliterating that airway behind the tongue. The other common place that we see obstruction is at the level of the hypopharynx. The hypopharynx is way at the bottom of the tongue, right where the airway, the trachea, and the larynx start. And th this is two MRI pictures, again, 128 pictures in two, over two minutes. So these are consecutive pictures where here we have the airway wide open. And the next one, you can see that there's this concentric collapse of the entire airway. So we need to do better. There's a critical need for better diagnostic modality. And it's not only the anatomy of the airway that we have to take into account. We have to take into account tissue compliance and collapsibility of the airway. And what that led to is an NIH, an NIH study that we have in Cincinnati called Dynamic Computational Modeling of Obstructive Sleep Apnea in Down Syndrome. And this is a multidisciplinary study involving medicine, radiology, otolaryngology, um, both at Children's Hospital and the University of Cincinnati. And we've partnered with the aerospace engineers. They're the ones that understand aerodynamics. And this study uses that same dynamic MRI data that I just showed you to create a computational model of the airway. And it applies computational fluid dynamics as well as flow structure interaction modeling. Now, computational fluid dynamics measures flow characteristics, flow of the air through the airway, velocity, turbulence, pressure, wall shear stress. And to date, there was a model, a formulation called the RANS formulation, that was the most popular in um, developing and representing airway flow. And this is an example of both velocity of the airway and pressure in the airway at different levels in the airway. The problem with this formulation is that it did not take into account the collapsibility and compliance of the airway. The RANS formulation assumes that the airway is rigid. And that's not the case. So flow structure interaction modeling is more applicable in the flexible airway structures, especially in instances where you have this dynamic collapse. In addition to the FSI, we're also applying a technique called large eddy simulations, which is a new computational fluid dynamic method. It's used in aerospace engineering. And using the two of these combined with 3D computational models of the airway made from the MRI data. It takes into account the turbulent th flow through the airway, <coughs> collapsibility of the airway, and compliance. The other thing that um, LES does uh, is it, it provides information at millions of points in the airway in regarding pressure, shear stress, and airflow velocity throughout the airway. Not only that, all those millions of points will allow us to predict where is the obstruction really occurring? Where should we focus our surgery? The other thing that the large eddy forces um, provide is it predicts areas of vortices. Now, vortices are areas in the airway where you have concentrational rotational movement, and it usually forms downstream to an area of constriction. And what happens is it creates this big negative pressure that causes further collapse of the airway. And again, this was something that the RANS formulation does not, is not able to capture. Now, here we have a toilet. This is the pro, the, one of the most practical and daily used examples of a vortice, that you have the rotational flow of that water. It goes through a constricted <coughs> part in that toilet. And because of the vortice that's created, there's increased negative pressure distal to that narrowing, which pulls the water through. It changes the shape of the water. It increases the negative pressure. These are some examples of some of our first models. We have a baseline model where we have that MRI, and we're able to get a picture of the model at baseline pressure, at different pressures applied to the airway so we can see how it affects compliance and collapsibility. We then make a 3D computational model of that airway. And from this, we get those points with all that information of flow, velocity, um, collapsibility uh, and compression so that we can better plan our surgery. So the aims are first to collect the data, then generate an individualized dynamic FSI model for each individual patient and each individual child because everyone's airway is a little different. From that, we can actually tailor the child's surgery specifically for their problem. 
and it, it will actually allow us to do virtual surgery where we can see the effects of small amount of changes on the airway to the rest of the airflow through the airway. The long-term goal is to improve surgical outcomes. Now, this funding, uh, the funding for this study was not through Down syndrome research dollars. But results from this surgery will improve care not only for patients and children with Down syndrome, but results for this study will provide improved care for all children and adults with sleep apnea. Thank you. surgery when you say you're collaborating with aerospace uh, engineers. Um, our next speaker is um, actually uh, Michelle Livingston. Uh, Michelle uh, Witten is sick today and uh, Michelle Witten is the co-founder and executive director of the Global Down Center Foundation. And Michelle, uh, Michelle Livingston is going to speak for her. Thank you. Well, thank you, and Michelle Witten does send her uh, regards to everybody, and I'm sorry she wasn't able to be here today, but, um, you know, thank you very, very much to uh, the Down Syndrome Congressional Chair for allowing me to go ahead and speak um, in her place today. I really appreciate that. And so, my turn here. So um, I am here as a representative of the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, and I am actually the Director of Operations and Government Affairs for the Foundation. Um, and we are zooming ahead here. <laughs> Um, and so we are here uh, as the Global Down Center Foundation uh, today to talk about protecting research and protecting people with Down syndrome. Um, there have been some absolutely wonderful uh, discussions about you know, the opportunities and the um, scientific research um, that is improving the lives of people with Down syndrome and improving um, potentially the lives of a typical population as well. And we just want to talk a little bit about, too, the perspective of also making sure that we're protecting all of those people with Down syndrome at the same time. So uh, I'll go into the uh, Global Down Syndrome Foundation background, um, a little bit about the uh, history of Down syndrome, um, our current challenges and opportunities, and then our conclusions. Uh, first of all, I want to relay, this is not my personal story, but this is Michelle Witten's story. And um, in 2003, Michelle Witten had uh, her beautiful daughter, Sophia, who happens to have Down syndrome. Uh, she was uh, prenatally diagnosed, tested high on the AFP test, went in for an amnio uh, at 18 weeks. At that time, she was shown a homemade video that essentially gave 1960s information, highlighting that there was a good chance that her child would not live past three, specifically listing all the medical conditions that she would have if she did live. Um, there was no re referral to a local parent organization, and the genetic counseling consisted of Mrs. Witten, please don't cry, 80 to 90 percent of people choose to terminate, and you can too. Um, she was given the diagnosis over the phone at 19 weeks, and at 32 weeks into pregnancy, um, they discovered uh, that there was a hole in Sophia's heart, and she, uh, the doctors then asked if she would like to terminate since a baby with Down syndrome would be an exception to the state's 24-week abortion limit. Michelle Witten very much felt like she was uh, strongly pressured into terminating her pregnancy. Um, she didn't feel like she really had a lot of support. And so the foundation, um, her family foundation that was started in 2005, really, uh, obviously Sophia was born and she chose to uh, keep Sophia. And um, when so after Sophia was born, the foundation really started to look into all of the uh, information that was out there and available um, and the due diligence for where the biggest need is for people with Down syndrome. So then in 2008, the, the Anna and John J.C. Foundation is the family foundation, uh, was the founding donor in establishing the Linda Cernick Institute for Down syndrome, which of course um, Dr. Ed McCabe uh, heads for us. And uh, in 2009, the uh, Family Foundation helped start the public charity, the Global Down Syndrome Foundation, that supports the Linda Cernick Institute and provides critical education and advocacy um, for people with Down syndrome. 
Um, the mission is a, uh, to significantly improve the lives of people with Down syndrome through research, medical care, education, and advocacy, and to support the Linda Cernick Institute for Down Syndrome to eradicate the medical and cognitive ill effects associated with Down syndrome. And we're guided by a wonderful vision and, uh, of course, very strong values, leadership, diversity, equality, hope, inspiration, trust, respect and trust, collaboration, accountability, and financial stewardship. We, uh, our foundation has started a number of programs for people with Down syndrome, such as the Be Beautiful, Be Yourself dance class with the Colorado Ballet, um, the Dare to Play Football and Cheer camps with Ed McCaffrey and the Broncos Cheerleaders, um, soccer camps, zoo internship, fitness classes, a live life skills classes, a Down syndrome symposium series, and of course our Be Beautiful, Be Yourself um, uh, show uh, fundraiser that we do yearly in Denver. Um, we have touched in the past year about 236 children and adults uh, have enrolled in our programs, over a thousand parents, caregivers, and professionals trained and educated, over a thousand community volunteers, and over 20,000 broad audience reach through our uh, public service announcements and our Rapids Halftime program that actually had our wonderful kids um, there kicking the ball uh, with the Colorado Rapids. Uh, we've been received several awards for our work um, and uh, the work of the Global Down Center Foundation and the Linda Cernick Institute. Uh, I'd be remiss to not have some of our wonderful pictures of our programs here. This is our uh, Be Beautiful, Be Yourself dance class. Um, that's always just an absolutely wonderful event. The uh, Dare to Play football camp uh, with our campers and Ed McCaffrey. Uh, the Dare to Cheer camp with the Bronco cheerleaders that I mentioned. And then the Dare to Play soccer with the Colorado Rapids. Uh, this is a couple pictures of our symposium series. Our symposium series is a yearly um, series that has educated over 2,000 parents and professionals with leading Down syndrome experts, uh, many of you who are actually uh, have presented who are here. Um, and then last year we held the It's Time Civil Rights Reception and Award Ceremony where beautiful Kathy Ireland, beautiful and tall Kathy Ireland uh, came out and uh, was a wonderful representative um, along with, of course, um, Congressman Kennedy. So, um, then a little bit of our background, of course, the Linda Cernick Institute Advisory Board led by um, Dr. Ed McCabe and uh, also Dr. Linda McCabe, who is head of our bioethics and uh, has done a really fabulous job in sort of putting the skeleton out there for how our recommendation for the registry of biobank, uh, the contract registry database and biobank and how that would be set up. And then of course we have the C Center at the Children's Hospital um, led by Dr. Francis Hickey and uh, who also has um, the wonderful, absolutely fabulous Patricia Winders there as our senior physical therapist. And of course we have some fabulous board members um, both in right there in our community um, uh, and uh, from the foundation. Um, since 2006, the Anna and John C. Foundation has invested about $16 million in research and medical care to date, including um, support of the Linda Cernick Institute, and here you can see a list of a lot of the scientists that we've actually funded. We're looking towards the future, and we're very, very happy and pleased with the NIH and the NICHD's uh, work that they have been doing in collaboration with the Down Syndrome Organizations and the Global Down Syndrome Foundation. So, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about this timeline. Uh, in October 2007, um, they created the Health Research Plan on Down Syndrome, and um, they identified a lack of an academic home as part of the problem, so that was part of the reason that the Linda Cernick Institute was created in uh, 2008. And as uh, Dr. Maddox had mentioned, in December of 2010, um, the first um, down national conference on patient registries, research databases, and biobanks was uh, co-organized. And then, you know, culminating then in uh, August 2011, of the uh, Down Syndrome Consortium. We're just very, very excited about the progress that's being made and very grateful for the support there. Uh, there are other opportunities that uh, we've talked about and you've heard from the other researchers in terms of um, potential for studying other conditions and the benefit to the typical population. <clears throat> and we believe, uh, as was mentioned, that there are many other NIH institutes besides the NICHD that can really get behind and support that. Um, the one advantage to being the only major genetic condition without a national registry biobank um, is that we can adopt the best practices from autism, fragile X, and rare diseases. And so you know, we're working on those guidelines to provide the most protection for people with Down syndrome and their families, the most funding so the research can flourish, and the most partnerships so that um, many groups will be vested. It really is all about everybody coming together. 
Um, we also uh, really are working on more and, per more and better information um, around the inaccurate information and diagnosis that's currently be provi being provided. And of course, um, with the new news that there is a first trimester test for Down syndrome um, that will now be available, it's available now in several cities. This is definitely a, a, a really, really important um, thing that we're going to be working on because so much inaccurate information is being provided and so many physicians feel ill-equipped to give a diagnosis of Down syndrome. <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, you know, little is known about Down syndrome because there is no registry as we've talked about. Um, people with Down syndrome deserve the best medical care to reach their potential, the best educational supports, tools, and curriculum to reach their potential, and the best scientists, many of whom are in the room, tonight working on long-term medical and cognitive issues that increase a healthy lifespan and potentially allow for increased safety as well. Um, but you know, central to that is also protecting um, people with Down syndrome and uh, making sure that the families as well um, have a say and are an integral part of forming all of this. Um, the word collaborations come up a lot of times tonight and I can't emphasize it enough. We need to collaborate with the Congressional Down Syndrome Caucus collaborate with the National Institutes of Health, collaborate with other Down syndrome organizations, collaborate with the broader disability community, uh, collaborate with the mainstream community, and uh, support bills that provide fair funding and resources to people with Down syndrome. And I'll just mention in here that as part of that, one of the things that we're doing is a November 16th gala in Washington, D.C. Um, that is modeled after our uh, gala in Denver that features um, beautiful models uh, with Down syndrome in a fashion show. And so um, with that, I'd just like to thank you again very much for uh, taking the time to be here tonight. We really appreciate it. Okay, and our last speaker is uh, Ms. Madeline Will, and she's the director of the Policy Center at the National Down Center Society and has advocated for people with disabilities and specifically for uh, people with Down syndrome for a long time. <clears throat>
example. Um, we've advocated for uh, increasing appropriations and reaching parity, uh, as others have mentioned, and um, we're focused on building infrastructure, and it is, um, it is a, it is a very, very um, going to be a near thing. It seems to me we have um, a great need for infrastructure, and yet the developments in the area of research and clinical trials are ahead of us. So this is, is something that we really need to focus on. <coughs> There's a lot to celebrate in the area of advocacy. Um, as Dr. Reed mentioned, um, it wasn't always the case. It seemed for a number of uh, decades, in fact, that movement was very slow. But in the past seven or eight years, there's been a tremendous amount of exciting developments. And it's about, it's about a convergence of fortuitous um, circumstances and developments. Uh, first, um, we have the growth of organizations like mine and, and uh, more parents participating, more parents interested in research and focused on research. Um, and they're pushing us to collaborate more across our organizations and to develop the coherent plan uh, so that we can implement the goals that we have set as a community. Um, there's the uh, emergence of tremendous leaders like Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, the existence of the Down Syndrome Caucus with Mr. Van Howell and Mr. Sessions um, supporting us. Um, there are our exceptional researchers. You've met them. I don't have to belabor that point. They're doing remarkable uh, amount of work. And uh, there are is also um, the reality of an extraordinary uh, committed government partners. Um, we've talked about the round tables that led to the, um, the request for information about contact registries and the biobanks and ultimately the Down Syndrome Consortium with which Dr. Maddox created. These things are happening in a systematic way um, but also in a careful, um, methodical way that is focused on problem solving. And I think that is the, one of the keys to success here as to why we've been able to make um, rapid process, progress in a, in a short period of time. Um, we talked about the Tri-71 legislative package, which was introduced in, in July. We hope that the uh, Senate companions will, companion will be introduced within a couple of weeks by um, Senator Brown and Senator Collins. Um, we, we, we need to have the biobank, the patient registry, and the consortium authorized, and we also need the centers of excellence that Dr. Reed um, talked about. The hour is late. I'm not going to um, uh, go on uh, at length. You've heard a great deal of, of the information uh, uh, from others, uh, distinguished panel members. But let me just say that even though I think it's a happy story, and we're talking about a tremendous amount of momentum that has developed in the area of, of Down syndrome research, it's an unfinished story. And we need your support, your continued support, uh, in order to achieve um, these very important goals that have been talked about today. So thank you again for your um, kind attention um, and your support. I did have a question on the Alzheimer's. 
several, several years ago, my daughter participated in a study uh, with Aricept, um, and that study ended before the study was completed. Um, do you know if Aricept will help with cognition? Did, did that come out of the study? Um, we have personally had some success with ginkgo biloba, you know, at higher levels. Um, and there was also talk of an ADD medication possibly helping with cognition. Um, so I was wondering, is there anything available now? I think the answer is so. I'll, I'll take that question. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, nothing really. So the clinical trials on Aricept um, were tiny and just didn't show an effect. And. Uh, this is an example of really doing it right. I mean, if, if we, you know, if it happened now, I don't think we'd do it that way. I think we'd go to the NIH. I think we'd ask our colleagues to help us plan a clinical trial that had a chance of telling us yes or no. So the answer is, Aricept, though tried, wasn't tried probably as well as it should have been tried, and the answer is we don't know. There were probably more side effects in people with Down syndrome with Aricept than in the typical population. Um, we mentioned ginkgo biloba. No trial has been uh, undertaken with that. That research, that suggestion come, comes out of research that was started uh, at Stanford in my lab. And uh, it would be wonderful to think it might work, but there's simply no evidence that that's the case. The ADD drug you're talking about, uh, these are beta-1 receptor agonists. These are, uh, these are molecules that mimic norepinephrine. It's a logical follow-through to a paper we published I guess now two and a half years ago. But again, it needs a clinical trial to be used. We can't assume that what works in a mouse model of Down syndrome will work in people who have Down syndrome. So um, this is a plea for doing things right, for engaging in clinical trials that are really well cared for, really rigorous, really have the right numbers of people in them, so it can really help and really know what the truth is, yes or no, how do we go forward? And that just isn't the case yet. Having said that, the Roche announcement is a really good thing because it says now real professionals, people who really know how to run a clinical trial, are interested enough in Down syndrome to invest in this. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll see some real positive results from that. And those results are likely to be ultimately translated to the care of children. They start with uh, young adults, 18 to 30 year olds. But uh, the hope is that after that trial is done, there will be trials that will focus more on children. Thank you. Is, is there any research being done on Down syndrome and autism? I'm not an expert on that. I wouldn't be surprised, but I think um, there's a lot of that autism that we don't know. Here's another good thing. Imagine this. Imagine that because we know Down syndrome is a genetic disorder, imagine that there must be one or more genes that are responsible for that phenotype. And in Down syndrome, we have a chance of actually pulling that apart. Now, this, overlooks all the difficulty in making a mouse model of autism. Let's just ignore all the details for the moment. But I'm thinking that people with Down syndrome have a lot to teach us about autism as well. And Michael, you had something to say? Well, I was just going to uh, just expand on, um, uh, as Bill mentioned, there's been some work on these uh, beta um, adrenergic uh, compounds. We also actually have a uh, funding a project with a drug that's, that's already approved and on the market, OK? In Down syndrome mouse model, for which is an ADD type uh, uh, drug, um, I just want to emphasize one thing that Bill said: racing ahead, it's intelligent investment. Okay, we can waste a lot of money on doing things not well. Okay, there's a lot of information now, and I think if there's one thing I'd like to emphasize about all the research that everybody's discussed today, it's evidence based. We want to make sure that what we're we, we, number one, do the right things, ask the right questions, do it the right way. But the other thing, which I think is a message to all of us, and particularly when we ask for in, in, uh, about increased funding, it's sufficient funding to do the studies the right way the first time and not just flush money away uh, and, and doing uh, 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 studies that aren't well done. So. And to, um, Dr. McKay was going to address the question about autism and Down syndrome research. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to comment that this is an area that is of particular interest to Dr. Fran Hickey, who is our clinical director 
and head of the Anna John Jay C. Center uh, for Down Syndrome and Children. Uh, and it's been an area of interest for of his for some time. So a number of the children referred to him uh, with the uh, dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism turned out to have something else going on. So really we're trying to refine the clinical diagnosis, but then we're also looking for protein biomarkers uh, to try and understand again and anticipate who is at increased risk for this, and then are there things that we can do? I also want to comment about the, uh, the clinical trials, that one of the benefits of the consortium that Dr. Maddox has put together uh, is that in our first meeting, I met someone at the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke who was actually asking for clinical trials in the area of Down syndrome, and who, uh, and they have a mechanism to improve the uh, the outcomes of such proposals uh, through, through uh, something that they've generated in NINDS. But I think by getting all of us talking to each other, uh, sometimes even in the same room with each other, uh, we learn that somebody's doing something uh, in another institute that can benefit uh, our kids and adults with Down syndrome. And that's very important also. And I, I can't miss the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty quiet here. <laughs> you know, NICHD, as I mentioned to you all earlier, was founded in the area of intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mentioned also that we were founded in 1962. I didn't tell you that it was by the hand of the elderly and former President Kennedy, who really had a, a real concern and passion for what we might be able to do to improve the lives of those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Not too long after that, we actually developed a, a, a group of centers that over the years have really uh, grown to 20 uh, that we call our IDDRC centers. These are intellectual and developmental disabilities research centers. In these centers, we have multiple uh, diseases and conditions that are investigated and researched. And oftentimes, you will see in many of the trials that have come through the center that the individual will present with both Down syndrome and, and autism, or maybe even fragile X or Williams syndrome. It's a combination. But one of the things that we've been very excited about is something that several of the speakers uh, really addressed today, and that is because the visibility has increased around Down syndrome and the need for research, we're finding that some of our very established investigators who've been um, supporting the centers and being the top-notch investigators in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities are now looking or at what they can do uh, with Down syndrome in these centers. So as you think more about um, learning more about NIH and what we do and about our programs, go on our website and, you, and look up the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center to give you a better picture of some of the other work that we're doing that is certainly related to what we need to do in Down syndrome. today and I just want to thank everyone I know it got a little long but it was just great to have all of you come here today we live we live streamed it so that hopefully the word will get out to many others across the country uh, what you have been doing for many many years is tremendous and as Madeline said boy Madeline's been involved for many many years one of those many that have been faithful uh, but it does just seem like it's all coming together at this time and to have the leadership of Dr. Maddox now at NIH and some of the things that she's helping make happen, it really is uh, encouraging. There's lots of huge potential. I thought uh, Dr. Mobley made a compelling case as far as it, uh, Alzheimer's is concerned. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, and it's going to take all of us, right, working together to make a difference for our, our children that we all love so dearly. <laughs> and, and as has been said many times, the impact that they can have, uh, not just for those who have Down syndrome, but uh, millions of other people. So thank you everyone very much for what you're doing.